And what we're here for is new ideas and inspiration. Bit of a challenge to any speaker, I've got to say. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to inspire you, but I will try. But my aim is to actually give you some ideas, to give you some thoughts and some things which you'll take away from today and perhaps use in your own department. And the vehicle that we're going to use to do that is to talk a little bit about clinical drug use. And so I have a number of things I want to do for you. I want to talk about excellence because that's kind of the underlying theme here. I want to talk about judgment, clinical judgment, what it is. And I'm going to talk about Gestalt, particularly to um, keep Linda happy. And also on Twitter, I don't know whether you know, there is an Emic bingo going on. There is a bingo card being circulated. And Gestalt, I believe, is one of the components. <laughs> if it's not, it damn well should be. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about education. So if, <coughs> if I can convince you that being excellent is, is important, that clinical judgment is important, then how do we teach it? Got 25 minutes, not a lot of time. Right, start with the question. Who are these people? <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> yeah, what does he do? Yeah, if I change the slide to this, would that make any difference? They're all coaches of what? Of what sort of sports people? <coughs> yes. So the message here is that it doesn't matter how good you get. If you're the best sportsman in the world, you can still have a coach and you can still get better. You can still improve your game and you can still be better at what you do. And when we talk about education, we often focus, and we talked about it a little bit today, about the trainees. A little bit about the consultants. I really like the stuff from Derby about having the consultants teaching. That's not that common. But we don't often talk about aspiring to be excellent, to get to the top of your game. So let's have a think about some of the themes that allow an emergency physician, perhaps, to be at the top of their game. What makes them different? <coughs> is it just knowledge that they get from a book? Is it their ability to intubate? Or is there something which is particular about us, which makes us great? Bit of theory, because we always like, some people like to have a bit of theory. I'm not <coughs> particularly a theorist. This is the Dreyfus levels of gaining um, knowledge, skills, and becoming great at what you do. And there are critics of this model, but I quite like it in a way that we start off from being a novice down here where we basically just apply rules. And this is what we'd be doing with our FTs, saying, you know, tie that chest pain, do this, put me through this process, come out the other end. And it's a bit of a blunt tool. We could go through it. It's relatively safe. Differentiation between down here and these people who are truly expert and proficient. What's the difference in emergency medicine? What translates that? Is it the difference between factory knowledge <coughs> psychomotor skills, or is it a feature of us? What do we do differently? Perhaps it's the evidence-based medicine that we have. I'm a big evidence-based medicine fan. You've seen Best Bets, you've seen the stuff we do on St. Edmunds, perhaps, if you're onto blogs and things. And you'll know that we like appraising the literature and we like to be at the cutting edge of knowledge and skills, and we like appraising them. But evidence-based medicine, is it all that we're about? Because evidence, if it's going to be applied in practice, needs to go through filters. And those filters are us. Evidence only reaches patients if we believe it. Evidence only changes our clinical course of our patients if we apply it. And we only apply it when we reach a point where we decide that it's of value. And that's a judgment. And there's loads of evidence out there that we're poor of this, poor with this. This is a paper from the US, or there's another paper from Australia last year, in 2009, 2010, sorry, looking at how good we are at applying new high quality <coughs> evidence into practice. That's a bad slide, so I'll mag it up for you a little bit. And we can have a look at community acquired pneumonia. Are we delivering high quality <coughs> care to patients with cl community acquired pneumonia according to the current knowledge base, the best evidence available? 40% back in 2002, I think this was. They did it in 2009, 2010, and despite the internet, the interweb, Twitter, social media, Facebook, Google+, etc., it was still 40%. So judgment, ability to translate evidence, ability to make decisions, is a key factor in what we do in practice. And if you look at medical <coughs> error, this is a nice study from Graeber in Archives of Internal <coughs> Medicine, they look back at when things don't go well. And I, I, 
we, Ross and I were just talking about this. I'm not a big fan of always looking at when things go badly wrong. I'm quite a big fan of looking when things go well. But if you do look at when errors take place, it's often not that people don't know how to intubate. It's that they made the decision to do it too late, too early, or with the wrong drugs, or decided to do it in the incorrect way. Most errors are cognitive. Most errors are about our thinking. Judgment is important. Now, many of you, have you read Dan Carmen's Quinty Fast and Slow? Just a quick show of hands, who's read it? Yeah, so <coughs> about 30% of you. By the end of next month, because it's quite a long book, could I ask you to read it? Ross is shaking his head. There are better books. I will get the first few chapters. There is an alternative. Go to the Wikipedia page and read it on Wikipedia because the major features are there. If that doesn't work, I'll give you another um, link to somebody else in a second who can um, encapsulate it better for us. But Dan Carmen talks about how we think, about how we make mistakes, about how we make judgments. And that's uh, what we need to think about. So he talks about systems one, systems two. And this may chime with you as an emergency physician making decisions in the emergency department. Type one processes. Type one processes are essentially pattern recognition decisions. So someone comes in and you have a look at the patient and the constellation of signs and symptoms just allow you to make a really quick diagnosis. So somebody you walk into resus and say, patient's short of breath, and you look at them and you go, they've got asthma. Because I've seen it before, I use shortcuts, I use little models, I use little tips and tricks, gestalt maybe, we'll talk about that in a second, to decide what to go, and go to, to do with the patient. <coughs> Type two processes down here, they're analytical processes. It's how we teach our medical students. It's how we teach our medical students to do a full history, a full physical, and then come to you with an idea about what might be going on with the patient, and then give a balanced argument about how we do it. But very few of us actually do that every time <coughs> we come into practice. System one thinking, quick, rapid recognition, making decisions on limited information in areas where we're time critical and information light, those are the characteristics of our job. My wife, she's an ophthalmologist, she specialises in ocular surface, which is like quaternary sort of weird. She doesn't actually have a structure, it's just a few microns of fluid which sit in front of the cornea. They have time to stop, to think, to go through things, to analyse things, to get diagnostic processes, to do tests. That's not us most of the time. In fact, most specialties, our surgical colleagues to some extent, our physician colleagues, are not in this area as often as we are. Clinical judgment, ability to make rapid decisions in time critical and information light areas are what makes us different and what singles us out as excellent in emergency medicine. And if you close your eyes and think about people who you've worked with, who you would describe as excellent emergency physicians in the recess room, would they have those characteristics? So system one, quick, rapid, it's what we do a lot of the time. System two, slower, more analytical, occasionally you need to do it. Recently saw a patient who was very, very difficult, couldn't work out what was going on. It was very easy to say, look, there's nothing wrong with this child, you can go home. And we just have to sometimes have that little check to go back and go, right, we're going to do a complete history physical and try and work out what's going on. Turned out they had a brain tumour because they started off with this weird constellation of sensory signs. So very occasionally we do system two but mostly system one. And examples from our practice, we like stories. This is one that's in the public domain, so I think it's safe to share. This taxi crashed in Manchester, um, came late in the night, and in the back was a young lady who was 36 weeks pregnant. She came into the emergency department, she had very severe injuries, she had a tear to her aorta, she had hemiothorax, liver laceration, facial injuries, a number of multiple fractures, she was dying. And people have to make a decision about what you're going to do. Do you take the baby out? Do you try and take the support in? Now, there is no particular algorithm or paper that you can refer to. These are matters of clinical judgment. And you can imagine the decision-making process in the room at that time was very difficult. The decision was made to do a recess room cesarean section. And thankfully, both mother and baby survived. It's a great case. We'll talk about the successes. But the cognitive load under those conditions is difficult. There are models of really high pressure decision making now done. This is a Klein model, um, which is based on uh, fire commanders in the US, if I remember rightly. 
looking at an emergency situation, you may recognize this style of thinking from yourself. So is this a typical situation? Have I been here before? Um, if I have, am I sure this is the right thing to do? Action. If I'm unsure, diagnostic uncertainty, we use things like heuristics. So does this look a little bit like the case I've seen before? Am I going to work it? Analytical reasoning, if you've got time, you say, well, I'm going to stop and really go through and think about this, but that's difficult under high-pressure situations. And shock dumbing, which is the augmented digital, augmented tools approach to um, shortness of breath, which is, I have no idea, so I'm just going to treat everything. And that kind of, well, but I ask you, how often do you speak to your trainees and your colleagues, and not just about what happened, but why you came to the decisions that you did? why you went through the thought processes you did when you were talking about a case? Or do you talk about it in terms of whether it was right or wrong? That was a great decision, well done, you did a great thing, you took the baby out, that was awesome. But do you explore with your trainees and yourself how those processes take place? Do you explore the aspects of clinical judgment when you're doing your workplace-based assessments? We'll come back to that. Now there are those people who would argue that I'm talking crap. Actually, clinical judgment doesn't exist, it's just a lack of knowledge. So it's a senior professor who walks in and goes, I think we should do this, and because they're eminent, people agree and they try and get away with it. And if you had as much knowledge as you possibly could acquire, you read all the books, you read all the papers, you wouldn't have to rely on judgment. Well, let's do some games. Let's have a little go at something. So I want you to talk to the person next to you, if you know, hopefully you know them. And I'm going to show you an ECG, and I just want you to have a quick look at the ECG and then tell me what you think's wrong with it. Okay, what was the diagnosis? Trifascicular block. Okay, so excellent. Thank you very much. Trifascicular block is the correct answer. So you calculated that that was trifascicular block by looking at the ECG. The first thing you did is calculate the rate, and you calculated <coughs> the rate, and then you looked at the QRS complexes, and you decided whether the QRS complexes were more or less than two and a half squares. Having done that, you had a look at the axis and decided <coughs> what the axis was, and then you thought, actually, well, it could be right down the branch, but that's what you did, isn't it? Because that was awesome. You did all of those things in 10 seconds. Have you? That's always. <laughs> <laughs> it is trifascicular block. The point is, how many people got it as trifascicular block? Some. About a third. Did you spot that it was abnormal? <laughs> <laughs> the point is, we don't teach the way that we interpret. So, my approach to this sort of thing is you look at it and go, whoa, that's not normal. That's weird over here. That looks kind of like a bit like a right down the branch rock. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. A bit wide. Can't see any obvious ST cysts. Um, interesting, mm, axis looks a bit left. A bit unusual. Not quite sure about that. That's a bifascicular, so I wonder if it's trifascicular. Have a look at the P wave. Yeah, it's out. It's trifascicular. That's not how, that's an example of us using heuristics and shortcuts and rules of thumb about how we generate through an ECG as opposed to the way that we teach. Do you explore that with your trainees? Interesting. The emergency department, we've heard about it this morning, is a difficult place to teach. I actually think it is a difficult place to teach, but it's also an awesome place to teach because it is the department of you. It has so many yous in it. It has you in it, for starters. But we're unbounded in scope. We're unpredictable. We're unlimited in demand. We're time pressured, uncertain amounts, uncooperative patients, unbelievably risky. These are areas which are characterized by the ability to make judgments rather than firm and absolute diagnoses. Have I convinced you that the emergency department and clinical judgment and the ability to make time-critical information-like decisions is an essential component if you are going to do excellent, awesome, and develop training? That's what, if, if, you, if I've got you there, that's the first part of this talk complete. So what do you mean by, what do you mean by judgment and gestalt? Gestalt's a term that you've come across. It seems to be all over the place at the moment. Linda Dykes to ask this question last year, and there were a number of answers that came out on Twitter. There were many more than this. So what have we got? It's um, pr just pretentious twaddle for instinct stroke clinical acumen. Where is Linda? She's not here. She's Skyped off, hasn't she? <laughs> Heard it before. Um, or Brian Burns, if it doesn't project well, I think it's a combination of education, experience, knowing the lit, and gut thinking. Well, since we're here, may as well have a quick think about it. Gestalt clinical judgment. Are these the same sort of things? 
Well, Gestalt appears in a number of places. It's there in the perk rule that we've come across. So if it's consistent with the Gestalt and an experienced practitioner, you're not positive for any of these things. You don't have a PE. So it's there. And it's implicit in other areas as well, such as the Wells criteria for DVT. So alternative diagnosis for DVT, what the hell does that mean? It just means you've kind of got a feeling it's not. <laughs> you know, we're basing our decisions on that. So it's there, but it matters. These are things which have been tested. And actually, that makes a difference. That's why it's in the scoring system. Giving O negative blood in ED for your trauma patients. It's a conversation we've had with Caroline in the past um, when I suggested we might give a tiny bit of clear crystal fluid to patients. <laughs> no, give blood. It's fine. But actually, making that decision I find sometimes difficult in patients in the research room. If they're absolutely shockingly clapped out, it's easy. They're absolutely fine, it's easy. Those patients in the middle, it's tricky. We use our clinical judgment all the time. So if you want a definition, here's a definition, a structure, configuration, or pattern of physiological, biological, or psychological phenomena so integrated as to constitute a functional unit, I have no idea what that means. However, do you recognize this walk? So this is my research room, there are four patients along this walk. I have a conversation. I walk along the wall, go around the room, I come over here. Tell me about the patient in Deb 2. Do you recognize that walk? There's something about people which gives you a clue that something's going on. It's not because you've seen the monitor or the heart rate or the blood pressure, but their appearance, the, the way that they look, is, it gives you the idea that something's going badly wrong. So gestalt this idea that when you see something, the, the summary of what you find, the summary of your perception is greater than just those individual parts. The overall picture is important. Originally, if you want a theory, Kafka, Kurler, Wertheimer, turn of the century, and they put this <coughs> as an opposing idea to the idea of atomization, which is that you could define everything, but if you broke everything down into tiny little pieces, you could then build it back up into a big picture. Gestalt gave the idea that you had a bigger picture, a big picture of, say, a patient with clinical signs. So it's more than just the individual element, it's how it looks in its whole. Can we explore that? We can. Anybody seen this before? You know what it is? Dog. This is an emergence phenomenon. So we see things from, we see a bigger picture from small elements of data. And there are other elements in visual gestalt, such as reification, where you see triangle, square, circle, uh, sphere, not mesh monster, and multivariability, so you see the faces and the bars. These are all completely different, but they're all completely the same. I mean, the mind is very good at assessing this information, the emergence which we've talked about. And you can see Gestalt, this idea of, of generating our minds, generating a picture from limited data, data in many ways. Does it happen in clinical practice? Probably. These are all ST elevations. In fact, they're all normal, according to the book I got it out of. But we're used to interpreting variability. <coughs> so, Gestalt and emergence medicine, is there something magical? about when we see patients that can allow us to judge and understand what's going on. Is it this Harry Potter thing? That we're all basically magicians. That after a long period of time and lots of time spent in specialty, we can just walk in and go, Tom the Embers, left lower leg. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do that a lot. And people go, yes, <laughs> professor, that's great. And then I walk off and then they go, order a CTPA. <laughs> Or is it more the Sherlock Holmes thing? If you watch Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes walks into a room and says, you know, ah, you know, I see you've come in um, from, um, I see you've come in from Cornwall on the train this morning. And they go, how did you know that? You know, well, you look dishevelled, you look sort of down there at the front of your tie, um, you look tired. I know that at this time of the morning only a train from the West Country could have got in in time to pick up the breakfast, a free breakfast on the train. Then you must have got off train. At the, you know, he does all that kind of stuff. So it's all these individual tiny little components that builds it up into the end. So are we Sherlock Holmes type practitioners or are we truly magicians where we just know stuff? Do we sense everything, we process everything, we perceive everything to come to a decision? Or is it that there are elements of our practice which we don't necessarily value but we do notice? And this is where we come into some of the evidence that's out there. So for, for some diagnostic studies, what they'll do is they'll only look which are measurable, quantifiable factors. So blood pressure, pulse, respiratory rate. 
Glasgow Chemist Day. You're familiar with those, and that's what we'd measure if we're doing a diagnostic study of anything. But do we measure things like agitation, <coughs> sweating, <coughs> eye movement, posture? Do those appear in the scoring systems that we use? Rarely. Interestingly, Rick Body, who works with us, who's looked at cardiac pain, has shown that sweating is an independent risk factor for the presence of cardiac disease. Why does it not appear in scores in the past? Possibly because we've never looked at it. So are there things that we perceive that we don't notice? Well, let's have a look at this. I just want you to watch this video. I do, I do <coughs> want you to watch this video. Is it going to start next week? Yeah. There we go. So this is Dave. Dave actually exists, he's in Leamington Spa, and this is a project that we did um, with the games company a while back. And in a minute, what we're going to do is stab Dave and whack him around the head with a baseball bat. And I just want you to watch him and decide what you think. So just watch Dave. Dave's dead. <laughs> um, poor dying Dave. Now, thank you very much for watching it. Did anybody notice this? I always notice because I watch this. I've done it many, many times before. But there is a point in that. We all watch nicely at the beginning. And then there's the bum shuffles moment. Mm -hmm. When was the bum shuffle moment? Was it when his heart rate went over 110? No. It's when he started sweating. And in that video, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's hidden there. So that if you, I won't play it again because of time, but there's a difference in the blink rate. There's a difference in the attention of the pupils, the size of the pupils, the way that he looks, the way the agitation works, the way the muscles work. Every time we play this, we play it with more information. It's the non-quantitative but qualitative signs that make people act. And that's why I think these things are important in our practice <coughs> and they're important for us to understand, teach, value and learn. So I do have an idea that Gestalt potentially does exist. Maybe we do have this big whole sum of the parts thing. But a lot of what we talk about in Gestalt and medicine is probably because we're just not measuring the things which we are actually perceiving. And if we start teaching and understanding these more, we can possibly accelerate people through those elements of clinical judgment. So, education in our last five minutes. Thank you very much for time. This is from Scott Weingart on the Uncut blog. I like it. Stuff which we teach in books and in heads and at psychometer <coughs> skill sessions. Stuff which makes us awesome doctors. The iceberg below the water. Doctors, nurses, clinicians, ACPs. People and their practices. Tacit knowledge. How many of your teaching sessions are based on clinical thinking? Thinking about thinking, not cognition. Exploring away. And how much are based on fact? It's a question that I want you to take away and think about. So can we teach and learn it? Well, perhaps we can. The data there isn't brilliant, but there are some good examples. It's in the curriculum, guys. In virtually every workplace-based assessment, it's there as clinical judgment. Do you discuss it? Do you explore it? And how do you do that when, you, when you're doing your assessments with your patients and your patients? Patients? They're kind of patients, trainees, colleagues. <laughs> what do you do? What can you do? Well, if you read my bio, I never wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a flautist, but I wasn't good enough. But when I was training to be a flautist and I needed to get better, what I would do is I would do an exercise. So if I wanted to improve my double tonguing, which is a real thing, then <laughs> I would do double tonguing exercises. And I'm one very good at double tonguing. I can triple tongue as well, but I'm not quite so good at that anymore. So I used to do specific exercises to make myself better. So are there specific exercises that we can do to make ourselves better? This is not rocket science, but I want it to become a focus of your training. 
the right question. These are not the right questions. That was, you made the right diagnosis to this patient. Yes, that was ACS, you were correct. Well actually, they could have just got lucky and come to that decision through the wrong means. So we need to change the way that we, uh, that we ask questions. Um, Ross talks about it as a learning conversation, so we need to change things like this. What were you thinking when you came to that decision? Right or wrong? We do this when people make mistakes. Do we do this when people make great decisions? Probably not as much as we should. Why did it seem to be the right idea at the time? How did you decide it? What else were you considering? And how did you balance that together? Now this slide is deliberately, deliberately, thanks Ross, because we're presentation guys, um, you c we're not designed to read this, but it's a New England Journal of Medicine slide. However, I'm going to mag up one element. This is a good paper, Bowen, we'll send the links out. It gives you examples of how to change your questioning style and explore elements of a clinical history or a diagnosis or exam. So here, this is an example of a patient where the, um, the uh, junior doctor has gone in and seen a child with a cough and a cold and a bit of a temperature and said, I wonder if it's Ebola. <laughs> well, it could be, but it's probably not. So instead of just going, no, you're an idiot, then um, <laughs> it does suggest that you do a diagnosis. And this is a nice paper, go read it. The learner has a poor understanding of the case or lacks a sense of relative <coughs> probability. Talk it through with them and then explore classical presentations and do a balanced discussion with them. I've put this one up as an example. There are others. Please go and read it and use the models in there. They're as good as anything I can produce. <coughs> do a sensory focus <coughs> exercise. If we believe that qualitative information is important, then how do you teach that? Well, we do an exercise, which I'm not sure is going to work. Um, I mean, we're struggling with the, um, the Wi-Fi, so it's not going to work on here. I'll describe it to you. You find a patient with COPD or asthma. You take your trainers in there and say, you're not allowed to talk to the patient. You're not allowed to look at the monitor. You're not allowed to look at any information. You stand at the end of the bed and you observe the patient for 30 seconds to a minute. And then you come out and you tell me everything that you see, smell, feel, hear. So it's another exercise that allows you to explore other aspects of perception other than the quantitative data that you normally do in a desktop exercise. Does that make sense? You do have to take the pa tell the patient that you're doing this before you go in. Because it's a bit <laughs> weird if you just have six people at the end of the bed, walk in, say nothing, and then walk out again. <laughs> that is odd. But actually, the COPD patients have done it. COPD is a classic because they've got loads and loads and loads of different styles to explore. They actually quite enjoy it. And lastly, read. When you pick up the next New, New England Journal of Medicine or EMJ, great, read the papers. Think about the diagnostic trials, the randomized control trials. But read outside of therapeutics, psychonosis theory, and facts. <coughs> Pat Cross Carey from Canada, great series of papers, most of which are freely available. I can give you the links for those, we'll post those. Carmen, Dan Carmen, read Thinking Fast and Slow. Bit hard work at times, but certainly <coughs> read the summaries, and there are many abbreviated versions out there on the web. Gigerenza is a guy from um, Germany, he's a professor of risk. He talks about the way that we perceive risk, a key element of diagnostic decision making in the ED. And Bowen's paper, which we just talked about, on educational strategies to promote clinical diagnostic reasoning. These have been tweeted out, they'll be in the show notes. Look at this aspect of your practice, it's so important to what you do. If Yoda was an emergency physician, he would say, emergency medicine is clinical medicine. We are truly clinicians. It's about perception. We can't do it unless we perceive what's going on with our patients, <coughs> but we interpret our perceptions. Only when we've interpreted them do we then get to a diagnosis. But diagnoses are usually probabilities rather than firm absolutes in our practice. They're usually probably got keys, probably not got keys. Judgment is belief, and it's our belief that leads to treatment. The theme in all of this is that you, your diagnostic reasoning, and your cognition are an essential component. So learn it, teach it, explore <coughs> it, and focus on these bits down here, and not just on that. My favorite subject <laughs> is me. So in summary, I don't think I inspire you. <coughs> You're a tough crowd. You're clever people. Hopefully I can give you some ideas to just go away, have a think about, and some tools to explore clinical judgment, which is what we do in emergency medicine.
Thank you for your time and happy to take questions. Yeah.